objective. Yeah, because we really do have a race problem. Those divisions are real. We see it in our politics. We see it in our trade union. We see that they take the divisions with them. Look at where people live in this U.S. You have enclaves in, in the Bronx and, and in Richmond Hill and in, and in Brooklyn. They're taking the division with them. Women are dying in the streets and we have a government pontificator running around campaigning for women's vote. No women should vote in this election coming up unless there is something done to the legislation as Magistrate Kim is advocating. That voices like ours that are not in the political trench fighting it out, voices like ours should um, become stronger. One of the things about the Caribbean is that we have never had one discourse. Vast will know the days of the new world and the old world and the radical left and, 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 and so on. What we had was this concourse of ideas, which I think in the early days of independence pushed up, pushed us in, in a certain direction. We've got to move back to that point of having these multiple discourses. Good evening. Oh my goodness, I know it's cold outside, but come on now. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. At this time, without any hesitation, I am going to call on Mr. Hilton Samuels to open us with the, I'm so sorry, prayer first. We're gonna have Sister Emma Oma. Omo, to open us in a word of prayer. Thank you. Let us bow our heads. Oh, our Reverend Richard said, please stand. If you can stand, let's stand in reference. Thank you. Most Heavenly Father, the Most High, we thank you for this day. We thank you for gathering us here on this occasion. We thank you for opening up doors, for making ways out of no way. We thank you because you are marvelous and greatly to be praised. We thank you for everyone that have come to gather for this great occasion. O oh God, and those that are still coming, O oh God, bless them. Bring them here safely. And as we go through this program, O oh God, bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. Let everything that has need to be done on today, let it be done in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Mr. Samuels. Mr. Hilton. Samuels? Stand up here. Good evening. Sorry that I had to have you guys exercising again. Can you stand again, please? Oh, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er oh, the ramparts we washed 
were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in a grave proof through the night that a flag was still there. Say does that star-spangled banner yet wave over oh, land of the free and the home of the brave? The brain. You can join me with this next one. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Thank you. And at this time, please remain standing. We are going to call on Omaje to sing the national anthem of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Give her a big round of applause, our up and coming artists. We can all sing together, please. <laughs> Good night to you. Dear land of Guyana, of rivers and plains, made rich by the sunshine and lost by the rain said gem like and fair between mountains and sees your children. So I say, never give up, never give up. My ghetto youth, my ghetto youth, me beg you never give up on your dreams. Me beg you never give up. Oh. Try and try. And try. All you got to do is try. try. And try. See, all you got to do is try. And try and try. try. It's try. Oh. Get up. Listen. Get a youth. See me tapped on the pan him shoulder. 
when we are drive to Brownsville the other day, Brooklyn, watch them day. The same ones we used to hustle with, we from back in the me never ever in a life would a day when me day. If me never would a change to me stop in the barber shop and greet for me whole barber back in the days, him used to advise me. Him say go to glad all your thing I take off. Him say tour after tours in a many different countries. Well, thunder phone I ring so much, but him go handle that. Bookings after bookings, God knows we grateful for that. See, all we had to do was try. All we had to do was try. Try and try. Try and try. And we succeed at last. Because we are ghetto yokes. We are ghetto yokes. We never give up on our dreams. Me say we never give up. Never give up. Ghetto yokes. We are ghetto yokes. Never give up on dreams. Yes. Never give up. I didn't see you got a mic. <laughs> Speak louder than words. Tell them. This is a blessing and not a curse. Huh. Can we not hold back no yo? Tell them. Can we not step on our toes? Never. Living in this new world order. Ooh. Your imagination shall have to be broader. Yeah. And your voices got to be louder. And your strength has to be stronger. Ooh. Even when you get to today. And just a big gunshot everywhere Cause every day it's a gunshot Look how the new man and get dropped Living in this new world uh. And your imagination have to be broader My ghetto youth Never give up on your dreams I beg you never give up, never give up, my get to you. My get to you. Never give up on your dreams. Me beg you never give up, never give up. What's my motivation for going so hard on this journey? See you now broke daily tears when me see Anne Marie cry when me lay down on the gurney. I saw the pain of all the mothers out there who will never see their sons again yeah. who will never see their daughters or feel a hope from them so the but violence we are condemned me say put down the guns and stop the violence i gave my word to my mom i gave my word to my, i gave my word to my kids and thunder see i gave my word to my people them oh lord me i go win for y'all a we son i wonder why me i go so hard it's for my Get a yo hot. Me say never give up, never ever give up in a life. You have to be what you're gonna be. No, say that you are get a yo hot. We never give up on your dream. Me say never give up, never give up. Get a yo hot. I'm talking to my get a yo hot. You never give up on your dream. We tell you never, never give up. up. Never I give say up. all you got to do is try. Try. Bless. Try and try and if try. I, if, I may, if I may steal two seconds of your time, yeah. please. Turn the guy in a paradise yeah. quick, fast. Let me steal two seconds no, of respect. their time. All right. This one right here, I want to send for, for travel span because this right here for 2020 travel span should be your theme song. Okay. So I want you to know that a Guyanese is giving you something to advertise. Give it to me right now. Guyanese, no say we are one people, one destiny. Stop that thunder. I, I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing my Guyanese. Where are my proud Guyanese at? Guyanese say yeah. Play it again. I want you to hear. It, sing this part. Guyanese. Say we are one people, one. All right. Say I am the Burbies boss, Bolt boss. Bur Let me introduce myself, Gucci B, with another aunt him. Travel span. Say this one is for the Ola Guyana. Burbies, Esquibo, the Marara, me bayed. All of the real gold and narrow heads out there. Say it's for the Ola Guyana. It's the Burbies, Esquibo, the Marara, me bayed. All of me real gold and narrow ways. You see when the Taba Guyanese come, come make we tell them about we Birdland. Tell them about the place where we come from. G U Y A N A. Where that spell? 
Let me tell you about me, Birdland. Show this how we put out where we come from. That's G U Y A N A. Let me tell you about my guy, you know. Temperature, always at El Patron, just touch down. The idea, you know, me represent that. Burbies, West Bang done. We are the crew where everyone talk about. Every time we step out, we them are talk up. See, we started from nothing, spread through word of mouth. Now we need for the whole world go shout kawa. TMO, you know me response with that. For the big shot, this swag, but are we make a shot. Firing, we did that, them call. We fi come back, said the need Gucci boss. Kennedy to Chedi Jagana took a first class fight with Travis Span when we clear customs link up with Sharon. It's a nice cold GT she put in on me and hey, let me tell them about the place where we come from. Make we tell them about we burnt land. G U Y A N A. Sing it out. Let me tell them about we burnt land. And show them say we proud of where we come from. G U Y A N A. Me want you sing it out. Level. Listen to me, level that. Let me sing the last part for you. All right, we can quick it. I like to quick it. I like to dance wrong. All right, in Guyana, I say, wrong here we party all year wrong. Sometimes sun up to sundown. See, sometimes it's the other way around. How much time they clean meat, we are left the grounds. It's something about this week, Guyana sun will make all the foreigners them fly come down. Well, in them tongue, weak, so are we a hope tongue. I'll pan mash the thunder about a boom dung from Skeldon. Current in New Amsterdam, where beast just down west side to Linden. Upper bar, take a no forget, let them want this one for resale, Amadia. Wow, make them know, say we proud of where we born. And take pride in her. We burnt land, we out of GT. Are we favorite? Paradise and the new anthem. Oh, make we tell them about the place where we come from. Come, let me tell them about we burnt land. G U Y A N A. That a guy and Make we tell them about we burnt land. And show them say we proud of where we come from. Travis Man, G U Y A N A. Pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, G U I A N A. Yes. And now I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, Okay, technology and I, it don't we don't work too well. Give me a quick second. I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Terence Rick. Uh. All right, all right. Okay, okay, moving right along. Dr. Terence Rickford Bla Richard Blackman is an associate professor of mathematics at Medgar Evers College and visiting professor at the Department of Aeronautics and Aeronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that's MIT. Dr. Blackman is the former dean of the School of Science, Health, Technology, and Health and Technology at Medgar Evers College in the city of, uh, in the City University of New York. Dr. Blackman graduated cum laude with honors in, Aaron, in mathematics from Brooklyn College in the City University of New York. He holds a PhD in mathematics from the Graduate School of City University of New York. Dr. Blackman was most recently a Black History Month honoree of the website Mathematically Gifted and Black. Now, mathematics, you keep that. <laughs> I am going I will be introducing Dr. Blackman to you who will be um sharing some thoughts with you and introduce our guest speaker uh Dr. Mark Bino who is the director of the Department of Energy in Guyana Dr. Blackman Thank you.
thank you for that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think we should give another round of applause to the musicians. They were wonderful and deserving of applause. Yes, yes. And, and it's always good to be reminded that one is Guyanese and that it, as, as, as James Richmond sort of said, you know, one is either a Guyanese at home or abroad. And so, you know, let's not allow ourselves to be, to be kind of, you know, make like difficult about whether or not you're part of the diaspora or not diaspora. I think it's important to recognize that you're a Guyanese who lives in New York or you're a Guyanese who lives in Maryland or you're a Guyanese who lives in Georgetown. And that is an extremely important thing for us to carry uh, this evening. Uh, you know, when, so first I should say one thing. I, I really want to commend James Richmond for, for putting squarely on the agenda as Guyana kind of experiences this potential windfall from the oil economy, putting squarely on the agenda questions of the folks who are poor and at the bottom end of the spectrum. And I think often we, we get away by thinking, uh, you know, let me try to get mine. And as I try to get mine, you know, if these people get theirs, then it's okay. And I, and I really want to commend you for starting at that place, for saying, you know, we as Guyanese, wherever we find ourselves in the world, ought to be very concerned about the poorest of the lot. It's as, as we deal with poor folks, so we deal with ourselves. And so I want to commend you and the organization for starting there and for laying that stake down here in, here in Brooklyn. Yes, that deserves applause. So I, I know we have Dr. Bino waiting, so I, I won't go long, but I, but I, but I felt it necessary to, to say a few, to write a few words down. And, and I think I want you to hear me in a sort of sober way. You know, what we, what we have now in this moment, we have a political campaign. This political campaign is coming up within the context of the first oil. And what it does is it creates a need for us to really be thoughtful about how we approach what's going on. And, and, and so we need to have organizations like the Three Counties Foundations, things that think about how we come together and how we think about dispersing what will come to us. And, and I just wanted to just give a few areas where I think this question of poor folks is really important. So, these energy resources can transform uh, the lives of individuals. We have to ask very precisely, how do they transform the lives of individuals in Sophia? We have to ask very precisely, how do they transform the lives of individuals in Lodge? We have to ask precisely how they transform the lives of individuals in Linden. We have to ask precisely how we do this in Wales. We have to ask precisely how we do it in Perica. These are very important questions, and these are important questions for us to think about within this context. That's the first thing. Like, the money will transform your life, but it will either transform it for the better or for the worse. And we need to think, we need to be intentional about wanting it to transform for the better. The second thing I wanted to say is that, you know, one of the, one of the areas where we have not really done a really good job. Now, so, I'm a teacher, and that's my, as was just noted, you know, I'm a professor. I've been a professor for a number of years. I study mathematics. I, I do it fairly well. Uh, but, you know, every single day I sit down and I think, the one thing I wish my parents had taught me how to do was to own and operate businesses. And, and, I, and I think that this is something that is so vitally important. And as we think about questions about how we, how we address the issues of of, of, of folks who are uh, coming from the poor parts of the economy. We need to be thinking about how we engage uh, young people in businesses, people from poorer sectors in businesses. And I'm trusting that the agenda of the Three Counties Foundation will be about how we help people to do businesses in, 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 in you know, the point is there's a large supply chain where people should be engaged, but we can't just say do business. We have to have some concrete plans about how we engage people in, 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 in doing business. So the other sort of thing, two more points and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll close. Uh, so we, we, you know, we've noted in a few days, the few days past, that those of you who follow Guyana, sort of massive uh, 
a number of car accidents where people have been dying and you know it seems so wasteful to us sitting here uh, and this is another place where I think we here have to insist that or, or, or at least provide the conversation for folks at home to recognize the importance of of the infrastructure, developing the Guyanese infrastructure, the road lights, the signs on the road, enforcing the education campaigns to enforce seatbelt laws, to do these kinds of things so that, so that we can diminish the sort of loss of life, the really wasteful loss of life that we, we've seen in the last few days. And, and, and so this is, this is the third point that I wanted to make here this evening around around ensuring as part of the Three Counties Foundation. You know, again, I, 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 I say Sophia because it's a place that is, it's, it's close to my heart in the following sense. I live in North Rhineveld. When I grew up, I lived in North Rhineveld, Nozama Street. And recently, on my visits to Guyana, I've gone to the University of Guyana to help things at the University of Guyana. And for those of you who know where this place is, you will see that we're able to travel through Meadowbrook and then drive through Sophia to get to the University of Guyana. And if you take that drive every day, your heart breaks. Holes in the road, your heart breaks. And, and, and so what we, again, it, I think it's such a beautiful thing to say, you know, we will be concerned about the poor people, but we will also be concerned, and I want to say this, about the infrastructure for the poor people, the roads, the drains, the water services that go to them, the electricity that goes to them. So again, I want to commend you for sort of putting this on the agenda. And then the last thing that I will that I will that I will add to this that I will add to this discussion. You know, this conversation is about Guyana, and you know, sometimes, and I say this here, uh, and I hope it doesn't come over the wrong way. You know, I hear people complaining, oh, this is not the best deal, this is not the best deal, they could have done X, they could have done Y, they could... Look, th they're gonna be okay. The point is, we need to look forward, right? What is done is done. You can't go back and fix it. Some of it you can massage, but really, if your mind is focused always on what happened in 2015? What happened in 2016? Who did what? What was the signing bill? What was, the point is, what we need to be thinking about now is, how do we get this thing into our education? How do we get this thing into our infrastructure? How do we get this thing into our hospitals? How do we get this thing into our schools? And so on. And how do we ensure that, you know, that the poor people have their full share of the patrimony? And so, I want to thank you, James Richmond and the Three Counties Foundation for putting this squarely on the agenda. Thank you. So now I want to, is he, is he ready to go? Is he, oh, is he ready? You know, so while I wait, you know, I'd prepared more. <laughs> you know, so teachers always prepare a lot, you know, when, you, when you're a teacher. See, and I prepared it, what I said was I wanted to say there already, but let me just give you a sense. So, so if the people were talking about in 2014, so just as a reminder, the, our, our, our introduction sort of let us know that oil was discovered in 2015, right? So I, I did some research coming in for this, and what it said, in 2014, Royal Dutch Shell sold off its acreage in the Stabroke block for what? It's 2014. Royal Dutch Shell, one of the largest oil companies, make a guess what they sold their share to Exxon for. Make a guess. Give me a number. Anyone, give me a number. Any number. One dollar. In 2014. And why? Because it was no guarantee that we would have this oil. They've been drilling wells over and over and over, over again, and nothing. 2014, Royal Dutch Shell pack up. They say, okay, we're done. We sell the business to Exxon for a dollar, a single dollar. So all these, so part of what I want to, I'm really happy that, you know, this opportunity, because I think sometimes we can kind of beat ourselves in the head. 
without understanding what really happened. There was drill, nothing, drill, nothing, drill, nothing, years. And everyone's going to say, well, they should have done this, they should have done that. Well, that's not the way the actual world works. So finally, you know, when they checked, Exxon went to 22 people to join with them to do this business. Only two people showed up. Well, they're lucky now. But the point is, I say this to say that even now it's not guaranteed. So let's, you know, as my grandmother would say, let's, let's not put the mouth on it. Let's be happy and have some gratitude for it and hope that it comes out and keep at the center of what's going on. He's on. Uh, the poor folks. And I think that I think that we have someone in the current uh, Department of Energy who, who, you know, I think is, I've met uh, Dr. Bino once or twice, and uh, I, I do believe that this is someone who, who has this sort of, the right temperament to be able to manage this resource. So just to say a small word about him, uh, Dr. Mark Bino is an environmental, res environmental and resource economist. Uh, he's the former head of the project development and management unit at the Caribbean Community Climate Center. And he is the person who has been appointed as the government's head uh, for the Department of Energy. Uh, you know, often when you, when you, when you introduce someone, it's, 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 it's a good thing to say. Uh, Dr. Bino is the former director of the School of Earth and Environmental Science at the University of Guyana. He's a holder of a doctorate in economics, environmental economics from the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. He has a master's degree in resource management from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, a postgraduate diploma in developmental studies from the University of Guyana, a BA in geography and economics, a double major from the University of Guyana, a certificate in environmental economics and policy analysis from the Harvard Institute of International Development at Harvard University, and a certificate in program monitoring and evaluation hosted by the Commonwealth Secretariat at St. George's University in Grenada. So Dr. Mark Bino is the real deal, and so <laughs> let's welcome him to the program this evening. Uh, uh, Dr. Bino, can you turn on your video, please? Yes. Turn on the video. I hold the bandwidth and Hello? One second, Dr. Bino. I just want to say, Dr. Bino, we do apologize for having you on this late, past your bedtime, and we do appreciate it that you stayed on, stayed with us to give us all the information that you have that will benefit the diaspora here, and also all the guys around the world. Thank you so much. Do appreciate you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you, you much. In 2015, ExxonMobil discovered a property offshore Guyana at the Liza One Well with more than 5.5 billion barrels of confirmed oil and gas reserves. Then, in September 2019, ExxonMobil made an even bigger discovery at the Starbrook Block Triple Tail One Well offshore of Guyana, a property with more than 6 billion barrels of oil. With this new discovery, Guyana is projected to earn $300 million annually from the Phase 1 production, which is expected to amount to 120,000 barrels of oil per day. Phase 2 at Liza, which is expected to commence in mid-2020, is expected to produce 220,000 barrels of oil per day. The U.S. Ambassador to Guyana, Perry Holloway, told a reception in Georgetown that come 2025, gross domestic product will go up by 300% to 
to 1,000%. This is gigantic, he says. You will be the richest country in the hemisphere and potentially the richest country in the world. The International Monetary Fund forecasts Guyana will see its economy grow by 86% in 2020. Natalia Hidalgo, a freelance Latin American analyst, told CNBC the reason the IMF is projecting that is because Guyana has the highest amount of oil for each individual person of any country in the world. In comparison to the OPEC kingpin Saudi Arabia, which has approximately 1,900 barrels of offshore reserves per person, Guyana now has 3,900 barrels, Hidalgo says. Such an explosive expansion of annualized real GDP would likely see Guyana register the fastest economic growth in the world next year. This means that the projected economic expansion would be 40 times that of what is expected from the United States, the world's largest economy. However, the lingering note of a Dutch disease still poses an issue. The Dutch disease refers to the negative consequences that can arise from a spike in the value of a nation's currency. The economic term is most commonly associated with the paradox which occurs when good news, such as Guyana's discovery of large oil reserve, can harm a country's overall economy. Vincent Adams, the head of Guyana's Environmental Protective Agency, who also worked at the U.S. Department of Energy, told BBC that we've seen the experiences in other countries. They got all this oil wealth, and a lot of those countries are now worse off than before because of oil. In another light, there's a story worth telling of a boy who used to play cricket barefoot with his friends in his village outside Georgetown. At the end of the day, his feet would be shiny at the bottom, he remembers. We knew oil was around. The boy is Dr. Mark Binod, the director of Guyana's Department of Energy. Though others speculate on Guyana's growing economy, Jan Mengel says that Guyana really needs to fix all of its existing problems now before the oil money flows. He says if it doesn't, the oil money will exasperate the existing problems and make them worse. Melissa Garnett, a waitress who supplements her income by selling potatoes, eggplants, and plantains at a stall at Georgetown's market, says people are in the mood for change, and they want it now. So, Dr. Bino, we do appreciate you can go right ahead. I hope you didn't keep it too long. Well, we just appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You can start. Thank you much. Um, it may help if you know the presentation. And we'll go through very quickly in terms of providing a general framework so persons have a better appreciation in terms of what's happening, how these resources are being managed and what the intent is as we go forward. Thanks again for having me do this presentation. I would have loved to have done it in person, but I think we all are aware of what the constraints are at this particular point in time as we ramp up and prepare for first oil. Now, I'm hoping to be able to accomplish four basic purposes this evening. One is to provide an overview with regards to the Department of Energy, of which I'm currently the director. What's our outlook? How we operate? What are the um, basic principles that will govern our general thrust? Um, to look at the processes undertaken and current implementation status, highlighting some of the department's mid and long-term plans and to sensitize about the sector more generally. Now, as, as, as a background, uh, the Department of Energy was officially established or launched on the 1st of August 2018 to manage the oil and gas sector. And I think that's important to note because consistently we ask questions about what are we doing with regards to the renewable energy sector? How do we relate, for example, in terms of the Guyana Power and Light? And so we were exclusively established to deal with oil and gas. What His Excellency, who is, also the pres who is also the Minister for the sector, has indicated is that should they be returned to power, he is aiming, or as someone said, not should, but when they return, he aims to establish a ministry 
of energy, which will encompass not only oil and gas, but also the whole gamut and the entire rubric of the energy sector, inclusive of renewable energy, energy production, and energy distribution. We absorbed the previously established political directorate, which was housed within the Ministry of Natural Resources, a relatively small unit of just uh, four persons, and that was absorbed within the Department of Energy. And I'm happy to report that we're recently due to support from the Inter-American Development Bank, we were able to articulate our organizational structure, budget, standing operating procedures, and establishing what we call a fit for purpose um, organizational structure for the department. And I say fit for purpose because this will, this is something that will cut through much of my presentation. Why is it fit for purpose? Because any discussion we have around anything in Guyana, it needs to be contextualized. And I'm saying this because Guyana is not a Ghana, Guyana is not Norway, nor is Guyana Nigeria. Guyana comes with certain peculiarities and we must take cognizance of those in any discussion that we might have. Thus, we seek not to necessarily build a superstructure, but to establish close links and collaboration with sister agencies who have a mandated responsibility to carry out certain functions. So in that vein, therefore, we collaborate closely with the Ghana Geology and Mines Commission Petroleum Unit, whom we are hoping over time may morph into the Petroleum Commission. In fact, there are strong recommendations in that direction already. And we have a Petroleum Commission bill, which has gone through two revisions. And due to the current political situation, we have not been able to close the loop on that. We have the Ghana Revenue Authority, who deals largely with regards to taxation issues and will also be leading the charge in terms of the cost recovery audit. The Civil Defense Commission, whose responsibility is in disaster mitigation and who is leading the charge in terms of oil spill contingency plan. The Ghana National Bureau of Standards, all matters related to the FPSO in terms of calibration, um, measurements, temperature, all of those will come under their purview and they have already been receiving training in that respect. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, anything that happens within Ghana's EEZ, they will have to look at, ensure that we're not causing any untoward border controversy. And so we have very close relationship and have further discussions with them before we embark on any seismic surveys or any such that may in some way um, cause or has the potential to cause any border um, conflicts. The Environmental Protection Agency, I saw you featuring earlier Dr. Adams, who is the executive director of that agency, and theirs is to look after all matters with regards to the environment. MARAD, the Maritime Administration, Ministry of Finance, and many others. The department's vision, therefore, is to seek to optimize the value proposition from the hydrocarbon sector within the Cooperative Republic to facilitate the transition to more secure, cleaner, affordable, and reliable sources of energy and the sustainable development pathway. In short, we are aiming to use the oil and gas resources as the catalyst that will place Guyana on a more sustainable development pathway as we look to the future. Thus, we are not seeking, therefore, to place all our eggs in one basket, and thus, having learned from others of what the Dutch disease can do, we have taken a very cautionary approach in terms of how we wish to use these resources for current and future generations. Our mission statement, therefore, is to effectively and efficiently manage the hydrocarbon resources while optimizing the benefits for all Guyanese. And these two words are particularly important. The, the efficiency, in other words, we're seeking to get the biggest possible bang for the buck while doing so in an effective manner, which means that it is seeking at the best possible outcome 
looking at what Guyana has at its disposal. We operate on five core principles. One, as I've already alluded to, efficiency. So it's all about value for money, looking to see how we can improve on what we are currently doing and not necessarily involved in value leakages from the system. Um, we will be challenged on a number of fronts oftentimes why we're going down a particular road and not another, but it is all conditioned by what we see as bringing in the greatest value for the country. Having said that, I need to put on record very early because again, questions are often asked of how the department intends to spend the oil revenues. And I have to remind persons, the same way we have the Guyana Forestry Commission, the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, the Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission, ours is to secure the revenues from the sector. How those monies are gonna be spent is a discussion that requires um, involvement of a much broader set of stakeholders that will come through the, the Natural Resource Fund and that will, re will reside largely with the Ministry of Finance, not with the Department of Energy. Predictability, and one of the things you will hear me speak about in a couple, is with regards to leveling the proverbial playing field so that potential investors, whether they be national, regional, or international investors, will know what the rules of the game are uh, as such. And so what we are seeking to do is to ensure that those rules are clearly known, clearly articulated, and that all who wishes to invest can be given an equal opportunity, but at the same time, in observance to the rules and regulations of the Cooperative Republic. Transparency, because we do believe that through being transparent, it helps to reduce potential uh, rent transfers, as well as it does provide an opportunity to allow persons to gain a greater level of confidence that the sector is being managed in their best interests. Accountability, we are always accountable to the people of Guyana because these are not our resources. And thus, we seek to ensure that whatever we do, we are doing it in a manner where we can be audited, it can stand up to scrutiny, and persons are assured that it is being done in their best interests and evidence-based decision-making. We'll be getting multiple advice from multiple sources. But what we're not keen on doing is just putting a finger in the ear and testing the wind. What we're keen on doing is ensuring that whatever decisions are made are made based on the premise of information and data. That ultimately we're doing or we're looking at the cost and benefits, doing your commercial analysis, doing your technical analysis, conducting your feasibility analysis, and then pursuing a course of action that is informed and not based on whims and fancies. Critical concepts, therefore, for the department, and critically what we've been doing, one of the first things we have sought to do is to look at building out a new legal framework. And why is this necessary? Having taken over the reins, one of the first things I recognized was that we had a number of gaps or legislation that were not necessarily conversant in terms of where the industry is at this point in time. So we've conducted various reviews and through assistance from entities such as the Commonwealth Secretariat, Chatham House, uh, Deloitte & Touche, the Inter-American Development Bank, IMF and other such agencies, we have now been able to compile a full set of where, what, the regulations are that we currently have, where the gaps exist, what may not be necessarily fit for purpose, and what may need to be repealed and replaced. We have also just about to commence contract negotiation through a procurement process to hire in a firm that will carry out that uh, revision of the regulations as well as putting in place the requisite legislation that will be taken to the National Assembly. Um, this is important because we believe, as I said earlier, the whole level of predictability and establishing a level playing field is important if we're gonna improve the management of this sector. In this vein, therefore, we've also produced a revised production sharing agreement template, and I say it's a template only because it doesn't 
only look at what will happen in the deep and the ultra deep zone. It also looks at what will occur if we were to be in the shallow or if we were to be on shore. It's attempted because various um, conditions may, may vary from zone to zone and that will allow for greater investor interest but also greater potential returns for the people of Guyana. Um, we're also building out a local content policy. You would have seen lots of discussions around that. Um, I am happy to say that I'm willing to stand up at any point in time and represent what we have put out there because we do believe, as I said before, we have to be cognizant of where Guyana is and not where Guyana necessarily wants to be in 10 years. It's a document that is a live document. It will undergo various amendments as the, as the society matures along the oil and gas um, continuum and also allow us to be able to engage and not necessarily drive delays or costs into the system. The natural resource fund regulations is also something that we'll be looking to work with the Ministry of Finance on in terms of completing. Institutional strengthening. I think we all are aware that whether you are in the Department of Energy or you're in the Ministry of Finance or in the GGMC, we all had need of institutional strengthening and capacity building. In this vein, therefore, our modus operandi has been to contract in, in the first instance, the requisite expertise and to have them mentor us as we build out the various structures. And this is open to anyone. It's not just expatriates, it's also from the diaspora. It is also from the region. Wherever that capacity exists, we will be seeking to engage that capacity as we build out organically. But we also recognize there will be some things that need to be fast-tracked. And for that, we also currently discussing the possibility of other modalities to help us to achieve our requisite goals, whether through management contracts, whether through bilateral arrangements, or whether through deepening and ramping up the recruitment process of external resources. In terms of resource development, we are keen to ensure that Guyana gets its fair share of all such resources that are exploited within the jurisdiction of Guyana. At this point in time, our heavy focus is on the upstream development because that's where most of the concentration is. But over time, as Guyana moves and becomes more mature, as more products begin to reach the shores of the country, then greater concentration will be placed on downstream development as well as in associated gas developments. These are some of the things maybe you may have questions on, and I'll be more than happy to elaborate on them even further so that you have a full understanding of where the government is going and where the government's thinking is, rather than you leaving with any misconstrued um, points of view, and we can have greater clarity this evening. Stakeholder consultation remains an important element for the department. So not only have we been engaging with the general public, but we are fastly moving to recruit a communication firm to help us in terms of the messaging. And I say messaging not necessarily to make the department look good, but this is a new sector and Guyanese as a whole are required to become even more educated in terms of what the sector means, but also what the indirect and multiplier effects from the sector can translate into with regards to the social and economic fabric of the society. In this vein, therefore, we have been engaging very closely with the Technical Vocational Education Training Council, TVET, the Board of Industrial Training, the University of Guyana, the Department of Youths, and many other entities such as the Ministry of Education and so forth. We've also taken control of the donor coordination program. As you may know, there are a number of donors who are currently assisting Guyana, both from a multilateral and a bilateral standpoint. And it's important that we not only take control, but we allow for greater cohesion in terms of how the, the, the donor support 
is being deployed so that we reduce potential for duplication while at the same time closing potential gaps of, of, of um, fragmentation. We are subscribing to the EITI, that's the Transparency Institute. There is a body that is established in Guyana. We had our first report last year. They're just about to start their second report for this year so that Guyana can see what it is doing, what maybe it still needs to do, where we can improve because we don't sit and believe that we know it all or that we have it all in place. But it is important for us to always contextualize where we have come from and where we are and how much more still remains to be done. And last but not least is a cohesive policy framework that all those who will 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 be involved can be able to fully appreciate the forward and backward linkages associated with the sector and to ensure that the resource finance infrastructural development is occurring but occurring in a prudent and fiscally um, responsible manner. Planning therefore for the future, for 2020 I would say and beyond. Our focus is to continue to strengthen the Department of Energy and to outsource where necessary, to have a better understanding of the subsurface characteristics of the oil fields, completing a feasibility study on gas to power pipeline. In other words, while we do recognize, and you will see in a couple, that substantial gas is not likely to come to shore until the, the mid-2030s. Government is keen to have some amount of gas coming to shore by, at the latest by 2023 to fuel the domestic demand, which is increasing and increasing rapidly due to the infusion of foreign direct investment and an increase in interest within the Guyanese economy. We're also completing, as I mentioned, the revision of the legislative framework. And when I say we hope to complete that and by mid-2020, that's the work. What happens when it gets to the National Assembly is anybody's guess. But I can only deal with what we have control over. Any other is outside of our purview, and I trust that we can appreciate that. The completion of the local content policy before the ending of this year, and then to move towards legislation. The last item thereon is pursuing what we call 2D seismic surveys in shallow water and possibly 3D in the relinquished area and one block that remains in the deep water area, which is called block C. The reason for the 2D slash 3D seismic is to provide us with better information in terms of the prospectivity of these areas, as well as to determine the shapes of the various blocks that we would want to market so that when we go to another licensing round, we'll be going to a licensing round with full knowledge of what it is, or better knowledge, I should say, of what it is we would be licensing, thus allowing us to be in a position to extract greater value for the people of Guyana. We're also completing the crude lifting agreement and the crude marketing arrangements. Now, you would know that we are preparing still for first oil in Q1 of 2020, but there are indications that that can be even sooner. The crew lifting agreement was basically taken from the AIPN model or template. So it's an industry standard document that has been customized to suit the Guyanese reality, while the crew marketing arrangement is one that we're aiming for to ensure that we protect the value of the crew thus that we are not putting out a benchmark which will ultimately affect future valuation, but thus protecting the value in terms of how that crude is marketed. I think many of us would know that the crude coming from the Lisa One field um, is basically what we call light and sweet crude with an with a API of somewhere between 31 to 35 degrees and very low sulfur content. So it is a substantially um, well-graded and well-suited crude for the market, which can be used for multiplicity of purposes. And we are aiming to ensure that over time, if possible, that this can become a benchmark crude. We held GPEX this past November, 
which by all intents and purposes from the feedback we've received thus far, not only was it bigger and better than the first, than the inaugural GPEX, but also persons felt that it did allow for greater networking, dialoguing, and transfer of knowledge and standards, which our country can benefit from. We are, con we are hoping to conduct a possible licensing round in maybe Q Q1 or Q2 of 2021, given the fact that I mentioned there are a number of things we want to put in place before we go to another licensing round, inclusive of having a revised um, PSA template, having a, 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 a revised legislative framework in place, and also completing our 2D and 3D seismic surveys. Implement a local content compliance unit that will help us not only track what is happening with regards to local content, but help us to better understand what else we are able to extract. So while the, a lot of the discussion around local content has been within the business realm, I think we should not lose focus that local content goes beyond just businesses. It's also about standard raising. It's also about uh, technology transfer. It's also about transfer of knowledge. And all of those we want to be capturing, analyzing, and being able to report on. And move towards finalization of the Petroleum Commission Bill, which will then see the creation of the Petroleum Commission, which even as we speak, we are embarking on a needs assessment of what that commission will really need so that when it is operationalized, certain systems will already be in place. A basic overview of the sector, and some of this you would have heard already, but one of the things I'm always keen to, to identify is that the sector is not just about ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil may have been one of the early movers, one of those who has had early success, but we have had the British group, Tulu, for example, who has, who has had two geological finds, even if those crews were somewhat heavier than initially anticipated. We have Repsol, who operates the Kanuku block and who is currently spotting. And we also have a Guyanese-led consortium by the name of CGX. So in actual fact, there are quite a number of other operators and co-vs, co-venturers, who are operating within the sector. Um, as I mentioned, four of these are carrying out different types of exploratory activities within the deep water zone and parts of the shallow. Those will include Exxon, Repsol, Tulu, and CGX. We've had 14 geological discoveries, and I want to uh, make the distinction between geological and commerciality because they still have to further be appraised before we know whether they are commercially viable and, and, and what potential they may have to be developed into full fields. Um, we are currently estimating a reserve of over 6 billion recoverable barrels of oil. Um, and the, the Lisa 1 field is expected to come into operation, as I said, either Q1 uh, of next year, if not earlier. Once Lisa 1 starts um, operating, we are projecting conservatively that Guyana will receive somewhere in the vicinity of $300 million from 2020, which can ramp up to significantly more by 2025, by which time you're estimating to have about nearly five FPSOs in Guyana's waters. Now, this is important because when we speak of 300 million, it is still a relatively small percentage because it represents just about 10% of our current GDP. Now, this needs to be contextualized because persons need to have expectations that are realistic. I think many people feel once oil begins to be pumped, somehow Guyana will automatically be transferred into a developed world. Development, as we know, is a process. It takes time. 
you have to put the right systems in place. And what the government is keen on doing is pursuing what we term no regrets measures. So you're not aiming to build a number of white elephants or a number of pet projects, but to do that which will really place Guyana on a sustainable development pathway. While at the same time, injecting monies into the economy that will not cause it to overheat. Because if that happens, then some of the same issues we heard about in the video with regards to Dutch disease, with regard to runaway inflation, can become a reality. So the finance minister is very, very keen on this. And through the natural resource fund, we have what we call the fiscal rule, which would allow for only a certain percentage of monies to be injected into the economy in any one year. Some more basic information. The first FPSO was dedicated on June 22nd by First Lady. It arrived, as she said, her precocious grandchild arrived three weeks early. And we are still aiming for early production from this FPSO, which is largely a floating production storage and offloading vessel, which will take the crude, process the crude, and store it here until the lifting vessels will come. Now, we, this vessel has a capacity of 1.6 million barrels. However, each lift is expected to be 1 million barrels. People persons may ask, well, why you still have spare capacity of 600,000. The spare capacity is to deal with any untoward event. So for example, you may have a lifting vessel turning up a day or two late. You just cannot switch off the wells and switch them back on. So that spare capacity on the top side would allow you to continue to pump so that even though the vessel is late, and there are strict penalties as well if your vessel is late because your crude is sold two months in advance. Thus, it is not in anybody's interest to be late, but things do happen, delays occur, and so one always has to be catering for those potential eventualities or occurrences, I should say. During peak production, we're looking at 120,000 barrels per day. And again, I want us to underscore this is when it reaches full potential now a production fee like any other will slowly ramp up it will plateau and then over time it will start declining so we will not start at 120 nor will we always be at 120 but that's the production profile that we're looking at and that's as best as the information we have currently available to us I have to say to us, there's been lots of discussions as well around royalties. Guyana has what is called a production sharing agreement. Now, within the production sharing agreement, the total benefit stream is not just contained in royalties. We have royalties, we have withholding taxes, we have something called profit oil which I will get to in the next slide. And we also have benefits accruing to us directly through job creation. So in the sector as we speak, there are nearly 1,800 Guyanese, not just with Exxon, because you have CGX, who is doing seismic uh, work and has established offices in Guyana. They, are, they have advertised for persons to, to demonstrate interest in establishing a shore base in the quarantine area. Um, Tulu, you also have Repsol, all that have all who have offices right here in Guyana already. And then you have the other tier one, tier two, and tier three contractors. So in actual fact, directly Guyanese are already benefiting from this sector in all forms, from management, supervisory areas, engineering areas, welding, fabricating, heavy machinery, cooks, you name it. And these are just the direct beneficiaries. There are also a number of indirect benefits which Guyanese are, be are, are, are able to, to um, benefit from. And I will make mention such as tourism. So when we speak about 
um, Dutch disease. It is true, but Dutch disease is not only about persons transferring resources to oil and gas. But Dutch disease can be dealt with if we are also seeking to raise standards. So one of the things we've been arguing for is that let's take agriculture. Again, has always been known as the breadbasket of the Caribbean. Agriculture, through being able to raise standards, through us being able to have traceability, through us being able to establish better sanitary and phytosanitary conditions, will also afford Guyana to not only increase marketing opportunities within Guyana and to get PS1 supply vessels, but even further afield. So we see one of the indirect benefits as standard raising, which will help agricultural resources not to be transferred into oil and gas, but to be expanded to surface oil and gas and the emerging Guyana that is to come. We are seeing ex ex uh, a phenomenal expansion in the construction industry and the building out of potential areas for, for such activities. What government is keen on, however, is not to have a hodgepodge of development occurring, but to have specific zones delineated and designated for oil and gas resources to ease the burden on existing infrastructure while also ensuring that the land use types are best suited to the kinds of activities to which they're being allocated. Now, I wanted to raise this with you in terms of the benefit stream, because as I said, lots of discussions have gone on with regards to what Guyana will get. Within the Starbrook block, the agreement speaks to the fact that the operator in any one year can claim up to 75% of what is called recoverable cost. Now, these would be costs that are directly related with the petroleum operations. Costs which the, the investors would have incurred since government of Guyana did not spend any monies up front in, in the investment, then it is only natural that those monies, if you go and you borrow money from the bank, you have to repay. So those monies have to be repaid. That's what that 75% represents. The remaining 25% is then split between government of Guyana and the co-venturers and the operator 50-50. So 12.5% of that comes to Guyana and the other 12.5% is divided up between Exxon, Sinoc, and Hess. Thus, at a minimum, government of Guyana will be getting 14.5% in terms of direct monies or entitlement in any one um, um, year, okay? And I think we need to know that so that the bottom line about the 2% royalty and that's all Guyana is getting is not accurate. And I'm not selling you something that is not there. All I say to us, read the production sharing agreement. It is patently clear. It's there for all to see. And it is on the EITI website. But this is not by no making up something. This is what's actually there. Once you have the investor basically amortizing their cost and that recoverable cost declines over time, then this 14.5% will naturally increase because profit oil will go up. So that's why I said at a minimum, government will be getting 14.5%. Under the orange juke block, which is what Tulu controls, we have what we call a sliding scale, which ranges between profit oil being 50% to up to 60% for the as government's share. So with the royalty, which is from profit oil, it ranges between 12.5% to up to 15% that the government can receive. Now, how does government get 15% recoverable oil? If the operator, for example, produces 80,000 barrels or more per day, profit oil becomes 15%. Now, as you would have seen in the case of the Lisa field, the average production at peak will be 120,000 barrels. So 80,000 barrels is not in the realm of impossibility. 
it actually it is in the realm of possibility. So I just wanted us to ensure that we are fully aligned and we remain conversant on these. I'm going to skip this one, another indirect benefit, since we have already discussed some of that. I'm coming to the end, so just bear with me. In terms of the gas picture, because again, many times you would person say, but you speak about oil. You don't say anything about gas. The gas picture is still somewhat occluded. And I say occluded because Guyana has not found gas fields. We have found associated gas. Now, once you find associated gas, the first priority is to use that gas to enhance oil recovery. So to the extent that you need to use the gas for reinjection purposes to increase pressure support, that's where we will be going. Now, over time, as the field begins to come to the end of its life, much of that associated gas will now become available, which government will then be looking towards to bring to shore, which can be used for petrochems, F um, LNG, and all the other byproducts that comes from the gas from the gas molecule. So in actual fact, that is why I was saying earlier, the gas to shore discussion, apart from just for domestic consumption, it's a bit early because much of the gas that will be, much of the gas that is found in the Lisa field will be used for reinjection purposes and will be used to drive the FPSO that has a capacity of consuming 140 megawatts of power. So as you can see from the next diagram, the potential gas resource within the Starbrook block ranges somewhere from maybe between 2 TCF to about 10 TCF over time. All right? So it's still fairly early days, and that's why we're just saying cautiously, because these figures still need to be analyzed a lot further. The next diagram puts it in, in, in context in terms of if we see the red as that gas which will become available over time. Now, you can see that most of that becomes available somewhere after the 2030s and most of it from the mid-2030s and onwards. Our priority, therefore, remains completing the crude lifting agreement or marketing agreement, enhancing capacities that I made mention, completing the contingent oil spill plan, um, outsourcing surveillance and early warning portfolio. This is because we want to ensure that we're getting early notification of any potential significant spillage. Um, how do we protect against potential activities on the high seas such as piracy? Um, and also ensuring that we are keeping an eye that persons are not poaching in our waters now that you will have a number of stationary vessels that they become aggregating devices for fish spawning and the like, and therefore become easy points for fishermen to engage in. Finalizing the crude reconciliation process and so forth. Now, I think in all that we're saying, what we're doing is putting the systems in place. Persons will ask, are we ready for first oil? And I will say to you unequivocally that what Guyana will be ready for will be putting the critical elements in place. Will all the I's be dotted and T's crossed? I think that's a, a potential that's, that's not necessarily going to happen. As it is, we have to be cognizant of the resources we have available to us. We also have to be cognizant of the pace at which this development has occurred. Um, in fact, it is said it's one of the industry standards that we have now established for deep water exploration. In less than five years, you would have moved from discovery to production. And therefore, while we do recognize that there are significant challenges that remain ahead of us, we are confident that we are securing the requisite framework to reduce potential value leakage from the system. So, in short, I will now open up for any questions or discussions that you may wish to have. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bino.
Just up front? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions based on the presentation Dr. Baino just delivered? Feel free. Come on. No questions. <laughs> no questions, which, mean, which means you did a fantastic job on explaining what we needed to hear. Thank you much. Uh, Dr. Baino, there's a question here. How large is the office? The office staff. Okay. Currently, we have a staff of just about... 30 persons, but that needs to be qualified by the fact that we have just moved in to new quarters. When we started out, we were housed in very restrictive quarters. But three weeks ago, we were able to move into new location that allows us to build out our staff even more. Now that 30 will include both administrative and technical officers. Mm. We have a complement of about 10 technical officers now with um, three legal officers, and we have four um, advisors, one in commercial, one in contract, one in crude lifting, and one in legal. So in large measure, we are moving towards ensuring that we are plugging the various gaps as we move forward, because we don't believe that the knowledge that is necessary resides only in Guyana. That's why I think this forum is so important, that even persons in the diaspora who may have the requisite knowledge and expertise, we are more than keen to engage with them. Guyana is open for business. I don't know why you'd want to be in a place that is that cold when we have so much warmth at home, <laughs> but that's a different story. <laughs> and we have a question here. As one who is very much interested in the environmental aspect of things, what is in place? Should there be a spill? Okay. Um, what we have in place, and that's why I made mention with regards to the contingent spill plan. First and foremost, there are different levels of spills that will occur. You have a tier one spill, which can be very minuscule. That will be dealt with by the operator and their uh, tier one and tier two contractors, for example. When it gets to a tier two spill, that needs to be reported to us. Now, we have been carrying out simulation exercises with the Civil Defense Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, but also with some communities along the coast to ensure that the requisite resources are available and can be deployed in a very rapid way. I will not sit here, however, and pretend to you that we have all the requisite equipment to deal with the spill. Let's be conscious of the fact that we can have the greatest plan in place, but you will still need additional resources to deploy those plans and to react should something occur. That's where we are now moving towards. Okay, thank you for that. And we have another question coming from our resident journalist. <laughs> Dr. Mark Baino, that was outstanding. That yeah. presentation was oh, yeah. unbelievable. What'd you say? That was amazing. Right, that's one of the presentations. What I want, I think I read an article where you said the first set of monies, I don't know, in billions of dollars would not be going to Guyana, any of it. How much would go to Guyana the, from the first set of oil? That is raised right, from well, the let me explain. The article may have mentioned that, or again, we have to be cautious with what we read from the Guyanese media sometimes. But what I was saying is that the first lift, meaning the first million barrels, will not come to Guyana. Rather, it, it will go to the operator. And there's a reason for this. The oil that is coming forward, we do not yet know precisely what quality it would have. We have what they call the assay. Now, it gives you an indication to the quality. But that quality can be somewhat variable until it normalizes. Therefore, it's a risk for Guyana to aim to take the first million barrels and place it on the open market. Because once you do that, if the quality is not stabilized, whatever price you get, and if it comes with a lot of impurities, that's the price you get. The more impurity, the lower the price. 
So you are benchmarking very early. Therefore, you are stuck with that price, even though the quality improves over time. So it would make sense for the operator who has refining capacity to take that first million barrels, take it into their refinery, at, as we assess the oil molecules and determine what's the quality of that oil that ultimately, once that is then determined, then we can go to open market. So the whole idea is seeking to protect the value of the crude, not that we are ceding to the operators, but you know we've got to exercise pragmatism in terms of how we wish to proceed with this. Thank you so much, Dr. Bynum. It's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Join me on this side. Uh, thank you again for your presentation, Dr. Bynum. Question around education. You mentioned outreach efforts. Can you speak to some of the education efforts that the that the department is engaged with? With, for example, youths in the in the in the through grade six and and then beyond what sort of efforts are involved all right well I, i'm happy about that because this is one of my pet subjects um as you know at heart i i came out of academia so we have engaged with the ministry of education first and foremost i had a very good discussion with the minister of education and we are now moving to engage with insert the national center educational research and development as they are revising the syllabus and now is an appropriate time not for us to have specific courses on oil and gas but to have oil and gas infused within existing courses so that more and more persons become conversant when they hear about a crude lift what does it mean when you hear about a fps so what does it mean when you hear about gas and gas coming to shore a gas pipeline what does it mean so it's within that context we, we, we need Guyanese to be more conversant. But even outside of that, I'd like to remind us that the focus should not just be on oil and gas. For the new Guyana that is to come. Meaning that when the monies begin to flow, where are we getting our civil engineers from? Where are we getting our electrical engineers from? Where are we getting our construction engineers from? So even as we build out for the oil and gas sector, do not neglect the fact that we also need to be focusing on that bigger, larger goal of our Green State Development Strategy, Vision 2040. Last but not least is the engagement that we've been having with the TVET institutions. And what I'm very happy about here is that in the past, there was this perception that once you go to a technical institute, is because you couldn't have made it academically. What we're seeing within the industry is that the industry requires a lot of those technical expertise, whether it comes through STEM, STEAM, STREAM, whatever acronym you want to use. But the reality is it's broadening the base, whether in welding, fabricating, assembly, heavy machinery, to help us to absorb greater volumes of opportunities within the sector. And so we are just about to start two pilots, one in New Amsterdam, one in Linden, which is being financed by the operator, Exxon in this case, so that we can uh, strengthen those institutions and ensure that the people who are coming out from those institutions are of the requisite quality, finding out what is it the industry wants, so that ultimately we're not just training people, but we're training them with employable skills. So that's how we have been moving in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bino, one final question. This one might this one could be hard. So you mentioned the 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 use of oil resources to transition, and you just talked about the green the green state, so to transition to renewables. And so my question is, how do you see that unfolding? Do you see that as something that is that is near term, medium term, long term? And what are some key elements of this transition strategy to the greens, to the to, to renewables, particularly in the energy space? All right. Um, I, I, I often get this question, whether it's uh, oxymoron, whether it's contradictory, 
how could you be talking about oil and gas and the green state in the same breath? I would say given, let's just take an example of where the United States is today. It did not start out where it is. It had to remove, it had some very painful experiences. But more important, oil and gas will not last. And that's not some little bumper sticker phrase. It's just a reality. Guyana has an opportunity for self-determination. Renewable energy is nothing new for Guyana. The Mazaruni hydroelectric power did not start with a discussion around climate change. It started since in the 60s. As some of us will know, the plug was pulled on that because of geopolitical issues. We, whether we speak about hydroelectric dams, wind energy, solar energy, thermal, geothermal, OTEC, they all require substantial amounts of monies. Those monies, therefore, we see them as coming from the oil resources that we will generate. So that if that one moves towards renewable, it gives us an opportunity to move in that direction. He has made mention. Now let's not be, be fooled. Eh? His idea is that we move towards a number of mini hydros currently within Guyana. Almost all public buildings are outkitted with solar panels, inverters, batteries. So this is not something that we are just talking the talk, we are walking the walk. We have put in place the fact that by 2035, we want to see our emissions reduced by 60%. In particular, we are also not just looking with regards to the productive sector, but also the transportation sector. So we're moving towards electric buses as a pilot to demonstrate what can be done from the transportation sector. And last but not least, the whole issue of bringing gas to shore. While gas is not a renewable resource, it will cut our carbon footprint by 50% because currently most of our consumption is HFOs, heavy fuel oils. Thus, just by reducing that and using gas as a transitional fuel will take us along that continuum of the green state strategy that we wish to go along. The last point I would wish to make, green state is not just about fuel. It is not just about trees. It's also a development paradigm. To the extent we're able to get gas to shore and get gas to shore early and have a reliable and competitive competitive rate for energy, then all the discussion as well around the Dutch disease can be dampened even further because it allows us now to add value to the agricultural products. It allows us to add value to some of the raw materials we've been producing. It allows us to add value to some of the forestry products that we've been producing thus allowing Guyana not just to be marketing raw products, but also to be marketing processed products. Thank you, thank you. And we'll take one last question. Dr. Bino, thank you so very much for um, giving us so much of your time. You know this is the launching of a new organization, and I'm sure for many of us who are here, we are interested in knowing how would your office work with this organization to share information about opportunities available to Guyanese here in the diaspora who are interested in maybe moving back permanently to Guyana and seek employment. And again, we are, as I said earlier, we are open for business. We are with your organization, we're with other organizations. We advertise opportunities that are available. In, in short measure, there's a misconception that somehow Ghana is just about recruiting expats. We are about recruiting whomever brings the, the bacon to the table. We're not about here trying to do, look out for a, spe a specific interest group, but we're here to do what is best for the country of Ghana. So we would be willing to engage with you directly, whether through information um, that we can share with you on a continuous basis. We are now building out our website, but we do have a Facebook page that we can engage with you on. I have an open door policy. 
Richard, um, Mr. Richmond will tell you that he's been able to get in touch with me by the click of a finger. It's not that I'm not busy, but I do believe to provide the level of confidence that Guyanese would want to see, because one of the questions we, are, we get asked consistently, tell us what would be different in oil and gas, because Guyana has never been a poor country. And so we're hoping to bring a new culture, a different way by which we do business. So I say to my officers all the time, you are public sector, but think private sector. In other words, bring the private sector mentality to beer. If we don't want three hour meetings, because if you're spending three hours in a meeting, three hours is what you could have been producing for people that really need the information, your service, and your time. So in large measure, we will be willing to engage with you. I would ask that you also write us. Let us understand what your remit is. What are your parameters, your membership, how you would wish to be engaged, and we can build that out. You may not even be speaking to me, because as we have more officers now coming in place, I can put you in, in touch with our, with our CSR officer, our local content officer, or just somebody who deals with diasporal affairs so that we have this dialogue going. Let this not be a one-off and let it not be seen that the resources are only for people who remain in Guyana. Come on, let's not be stupid about this. You have other nations who are coming into Guyana and benefiting from it. If you were willing to come back, depending on what conditions we are able to establish and agree upon, then you are more than welcome. And you can quote me on this. So, so, so Dr. Bino, I just want to thank you very much for your time and, uh, and, and the knowledge that you have given to us today. I am speaking to the, um, Dr. Bino and also the, the, the camera, right? So thank you very much. I want to thank you very much. Now, they will. my question. And every good wish with the new organization. Thank you very much. My question is, um, do you think that Guyana, I mean Guyanese, are ready for this big oil boom? that is coming in Guyana? And if not, what are you doing to educate the Guyanese about what's going on? The big boom. Again, I am, I think, before we speak about the big boom, I think Guyanese need to be educated with regards to what is coming. Information sharing, information dissemination. And I would also say in some ways, um, managing expectation. Because what I outlined, is that in the first year, 300 million is a lot, but it only represents 10% of our GDP. So again, it doesn't mean that every Guyanese somehow will automatically become a millionaire. So yes, there will be infrastructure to be rehabilitated and enhanced. There will be need for reliable and stable electricity. My president has made mention of the fact that he's people, he wants to take a people-centered developmental approach and focus heavily on education. We have to get our people back in schools where they're not just going to schools, but they're, re they're receiving employable skills. They're becoming critical thinkers again. So in large measure, it is being able to manage those expectations so that when people hear oil is coming, we just don't fold our hands and say, well, I'm waiting for my portion to arrive. Some of the things we're doing, training, outreach, um, entrepreneurial skills. We're also now moving to establishing soft loans so that persons who have the requisite skills don't have to be looking to somebody to employ them, but they can start their own businesses. What's important here also is having some control of the assets over which Guyana has. So we, we're training our people, not just to become employees, but to become entrepreneurs as well. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the Three Counties Foundation, the Guyana Housing Oil Movement, we want to thank you very much, Dr. Bino, for your time for your knowledge and your dedication to Guyana and everything that's for the, old for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you much.
drums. I love that. <laughs> I love saying drums. This song's so good. You know, I want to, at this time, take time out to thank. Don't take off that camera. You, you, got, you got a few more minutes. Thank Travel Span and Globe, Globe Span 24 7. Mr. Singh, Mr. Nohar Singh, for a wonderful job. And this te technician, extraordinary. You know, for a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're going to close it out on the drums. Drums! Drums of Guyana! African drum! Hinjan drum! The Tassa drum! Masquerade drum! for drum drums where the drummers there where the drummers 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 down the river Essequibo where the Pomeroon meets to get my pot of gold my journey to complete under the shores like men of your toiling in the sun and heat of this blessed earth my melodic songs will seek like poetry and the reverent hymn with reverence meek i bow my mud cake feet on the ground that my god did speak and shout to the heavens my elder rather i found which men seek to journey home along my river's banks and caves my vivid dream and my cinder will come to talk in lofty phrase of my travels and things i have seen under the moonlit sky of the days bringing to life a newborn to the essence of life once left amazed and the things that men found can never be heaven bound and craved <laughs> like <laughs> food to return <laughs> to the <laughs> public room to refill the vision of all age all sons and daughters will journey to and always will remain in Guyana. Parkland, where from the bosom remembers again, even in solitude and distant lands, I will hasten to bring fame to my beloved mother or father, my heartfelt love, a heart which bled in pain. Demerara, Burbies, as you could away the Pomeroon meets, Guyana remain. Destiny, mama, look from where you call it. Destiny, mama, look from where you call it. Destiny, everybody now, yay! Destiny, mama, why are you, you calling? Destiny. Yeah. Guyana, oozing oil. Where in mid air dangles the famous phrase, oil don't spoil. Guyana, oozing oil. It's coming from offshore. Exxon Mobil, Hess, and many oil giants bringing it in galore from the acclaimed stop book block in the middle guyan on the road of fame like a diddle diddle guyana oozing oil remember it's the children's soil guyana oozing oil come on with the enigmatic stop book block immersed in production and locked flanked by the rhyme block of the land of the arawak Guyana oozing oil, Guyana's children, not the polity owning rights to emoluments. Oil, hail to the land of many waters and its pristine alluvial soil. Guyana oozing oil, growing still the Kanupu block will stand in time in greater stock. A mirroring of the quarantine block, wise like a trending song unlocks. Guyana oozing oil, standing guard of his luscious beauty unspoiled. Guyana oozing oil, far across the Orange block. Barreling through the flooded dock, hoist the gas upon the land from the bedrock, must obtain full benefit for it all interlocks. Guyana oozing oil, the Guyana basin of washing crude oil. Where is the refinery, my friends and family? It's our soil, up from the mighty Demerara block. Rise up, sons and daughters of this blessed rock. Be vigilant, black gold curse can kill 
and cause havoc. Guyana oozing oil. As a nation, we must toil through the vanity of the heart and the toil, dispelling the essence of failure and mock as you rest upon from a room solid block. Guyana oozing oil. Don't run from the fiddle or jump the moon. The dogs will laugh with joy if they just run away with the spoon. Diana oozing oil, who must get the oil that's oozing? Mouth open, story jump out, accusing. The old woman in Chitanka walking. The old cane cutter in bush that they're frying. The poor teacher who taught the politicians everything. The retirees with little friends and all next to nothing. Who must get the oil that's oozing? The old woman singing, a little more oil in my lap. Keep it morning. A little more oil in my lamp, I say. Little more oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Keep it burning till the break of the Guyana oozing oil. Why Guyana oozing oil? The youth is out of home oil. When will there be a better day? Well, Guyana oozing oil, on my knees I'll pray. Who will enjoy the good life? What about the power politics and strife? Diana oozing oil for the country or for the period of political party? Diana oozing oil, keep oozing, keep oozing. Then you will be held accountable from Bobby Stamarar and Tessie Kubo. It's gonna be big, big trouble. I watch him, look at me here. I watch him drop! Check one two, one two. Check one two. Check one two, one one two, one one two. Yeah. One one two, one one two. Huh? Yeah, nice. Check one two, one two, one two. Check one two, one one two. Check one two one 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 two. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank <laughs> you.